This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Circus With the recent folder all with Patreon, and incidentally, if you're a supporter of ours, make sure you've listened to last week's important announcement. With the recent folder all surrounding Patreon, we here at the Word of the Week are strongly considering giving it all up and running away to join the circus. Surely you've heard that phrase before, right? Or are we just showing our age again? Once upon a time, that phrase was something of a cliché. Adults frustrated with their lives, especially those going through a midlife crisis, would often utter it in much the way we just did. I just want to give all of this up, run away, and join the circus. Young adults and recent college graduates struggling to find their place in the world, or at least to find a job, would dream of the showman's life. And kids, frustrated by their parents' unreasonable demands to eat their vegetables, clean their rooms, and go to bed, would dream of sneaking out the window and becoming lion tamers and acrobats. In fiction, it was, for a long time, an often vote cliched background for a young runaway cum hero. And many a Dungeons and Dragons bard got their start, according to their copious and self-aggrandizing backstory, many bards got their start by running away to join some traveling show. And that's thanks to fantasy books, from the traveling show that Nynaeve and Elaine joined in the Wheel of Time series to Mommy Fortuna's Midnight Carnival in The Last Unicorn. The idea of brightly colored covered wagons traveling from place to place with fantastic beasts and acrobats and wizards, performers gathering up promising young blacksmiths' apprentices and farmhands and urchins and turning them into would-be adventurers, that really does fit firmly in the sort of medieval fantasy world of Dungeons and Dragons, doesn't it? Maybe it does. But it really doesn't fit into the actual historical world. We're sorry to tell you that the traveling circus is actually a very modern invention. Oh, we hear you protesting that the word circus comes from ancient Rome. You know for a fact that Roman patricians and plebeians alike gathered to enjoy shows at the great Circus Maximus between Aventine and Palatine Hill in Rome. And yes, you are right. Your knowledge of ancient Roman geography is quite impressive. Unfortunately, what you've got wrong is that the circus wasn't a circus at all. Or rather, it was. But what we call a circus isn't a circus, because the circus was just a circle, and the circle was a racetrack. Way back in the 6th century BCE, the fifth king of Rome, Tarquinius Priscus, ordered the clearing of the land between the aforementioned hills, which was prone to flooding and therefore mostly unused. He ordered the clearing of the land so that he could enjoy watching his favorite sport, chariot racing. If you're not familiar with it, a chariot is basically just a platform on two wheels that is drawn by a horse. And they've been around forever. At least they've been around for a long time. And it was invented as the combination of two other inventions that met in a wide, narrow strip of grassland in Eurasia that runs from modern-day Hungary to China and encompasses the Ukraine, Mongolia, and southern Russia. Those hilly grasslands are known as steppe lands, after an ancient Russian word for wasteland. Have you watched Game of Thrones or read the books? The Dothraki Wastes? Those are the steppe lands of Eurasia. Anyway, the steppe lands were agriculturally pretty useless, but they were homes to herds of various animals that actually made pretty good eating. And so itinerant hunter-gatherer tribes called them home. And sometime before 2500 BCE, the Steplanders figured out the trick of domestication. That is, they figured out that you could breed animals and train them to obey you. And then you didn't have to go chasing them around the landscape when you wanted to eat them. And there would always be more. And among the various animals they bred for food were sheep and a certain long-legged, hoofed mammal native to the Steplands. Horses. For food. But then, somehow, an invention arrived from Mesopotamia to the south. It was a pretty simple thing, just a circle, really. But it allowed you to move heavy things along the ground very easily. It was called the wheel. We're not sure who figured out the idea of attaching a wheeled platform to a horse, or why. 
But the archaeological evidence suggests that horse-drawn chariots actually predate the wide use of horseback riding. While there is evidence that humans did try to mount and ride horses early in their domestication, it seems that those experiments didn't go very well and the idea was abandoned. In fact, horseback riding didn't see widespread acceptance until almost 1500 years after the chariot had become a major instrument of war. And it did become a major instrument of war, we mean. By the second millennium BCE, chariots had spread to the area of modern-day Syria, and they quickly became a military weapon without equal. In 1700 BCE, the Hittites conquered their first kingdom by combining the chariot with another recent invention, the compound bow. A compound bow is a version of the normal bow, as in a bow and arrow. It's a version of the normal bow that is made of strips of different materials. That gives it much more power. The compound bows the Hittites employed could accurately hit a target at a thousand feet and could penetrate the best armors of the day at 300 feet. And that's why it remained a popular weapon for charioteers and mounted warriors as late as the 19th century CE in China. The chariot was gradually supplanted once horseback riding became a thing in around 500 BCE. But by that time, the chariot was everywhere, Egypt, Greece, the Middle East, everywhere. And although it fell out of favor as an instrument of war, it remained a popular method of personal transportation. And chariot racing remained a popular sport. And that brings us back to the Circus Maximus in Rome. King Tarquinius loved the sport, and he had a great oval racetrack cleared. He also had a permanent starting gate constructed on which seven wooden eggs were placed. Those eggs counted the laps. After each lap, an egg was removed. Around 33 BCE, the eggs were replaced by bronze dolphins. And we're not sure why they chose eggs or dolphins. The Romans were just weird sometimes. Over time, wooden stands were added for nobles and then for plebeians, so common folk could enjoy the races. But those burned down. Twice, actually. The first time was during the reign of Emperor Augustus. He had the stands rebuilt and also added an obelisk he'd looted from Egypt. The second time was during the famous fire that tore through Rome during the rule of Emperor Nero. But we should point out here that Nero did not fiddle while the circus and the rest of Rome burned down, despite the famous adage. The story goes that in July of 64 CE, a great fire ravaged Rome. It destroyed 70% of the city and left half the surviving population homeless. At that time, Rome was ruled by an emperor named Nero. He's widely regarded as a cruel, sadistic, and ineffectual ruler. And so, legend tells that mad Nero danced through the streets playing a fiddle while the city burned around him and while his people died. Now, there are a few holes in this story. The most important hole is that the fiddle did not exist until the 11th century. So unless Nero was a time traveler, or helped Bill S. Preston Esquire and Ted Theodore Logan get through a first-year humanities course at community college sometime after they managed to graduate high school, he wasn't fiddling. More importantly, he wasn't even in Rome for the fire. He was at his villa in Antium. He did, however, return to Rome immediately and start enacting relief measures. Unfortunately, he was so unpopular that he didn't score any points for that. He did win a few points for blaming an obscure religious cult called the Christians and having many of them arrested and executed, though. But he lost those points when he used land cleared by the fire to build his massive golden palace and its attached pleasure garden. Honestly, fiddling while the city burned would not have been out of character. But we digress. It was after the second fire that the massive marble stadium that most people associate with the Circus Maximus was built. You know, the one that Ben-Hur raced around in the classic movie? Or would have done if he had also been a time traveler, since that movie was set almost a century before the marble stadium had been built. But again, we digress. The point is, the ancient Romans did not watch lion tamers and tigers and bears at some marble big top. Their circus was a racetrack, and the modern idea of the circus wasn't born with traveling animal shows in the medieval period. It was born in 1770. Interestingly enough, though, 
It was called a circus precisely because of the ancient Roman racetrack. The story begins with an English cavalryman, the retired Sergeant Major Philip Astley. During his service as part of Colonel Elliot's 15th Light Dragoons Regiment, which we only mention because it's a cool name, during his service in the Seven Years' War, Astley became renowned as a horsebreaker and trainer. And after his retirement, he got involved in a practice that was sweeping across Europe. It was called trick riding. Basically, it involved riding a horse while performing various gymnastic and acrobatic feats. He toured for some time before settling down outside London. And then he opened a riding school so he could train a new generation of trick riders. His school featured a massive ringed arena that he called a circus. Or rather, he referred to it as his circus ring, which, as you now know, is somewhat redundant. Astley became highly successful, just not as a teacher. People came from all over to watch the equestrian expert perform. But eventually, the novelty of his performances started to wear off and crowds began to thin. And so he started to bring in other performances. He hired acrobats, rope dancers, and jugglers to round out the show. He also stole a tradition from the Elizabethan theaters of the time. He would have garishly costumed performers fill time between acts with tumbling, juggling, and general silliness. And thus, he created the Circus Clown. Astley opened other circuses near other cities, including a highly successful circus in Paris. And it was at that point that competitors started to appear. And they started to compete with each other by offering grander performances inside more and more flamboyant and eye-catching circus buildings. Yes, that's right, buildings. See, the circus wasn't really a traveling thing at all. It was a fixed thing. They had their own venues. In fact, by the early 1800s, there were circus buildings in every major European city, as well as in New York, Philadelphia, Montreal, and Mexico City. The idea of a traveling circus was born in America. And like so many things born in America during that time period, it was a product of American westward expansion. In the early 19th century, America was a rapidly growing country with few large cities remotely comparable to the cities of Europe and many people were spread across a westward marching frontier. Simply put, American cities couldn't sustain a permanent circus. Showmen who wanted to entertain the American populace had to bring their shows to the people. And the story of the traveling circus begins with a cattle rancher named Hakaliah Bailey from Summers, New York. Bailey bought an elephant. That's seriously how this story starts. It starts with a rancher buying an African elephant and he started to travel from city to city showing off his elephant. This was around 1825. And he became popular. Popular enough that numerous other farmers from Summers, New York, decided to get into the exotic animal show business. And among them was Joshua Purdy Brown. Brown had the innovation of enclosing the exhibition in a large, importable canvas tent. In 1835, a coalition of farmers turned showmen, including the original group from Summers, formed a group called the Zoological Institute. It was basically a sort of corporate trust that controlled 13 traveling animal shows and three traveling circuses. And thus was born the idea of a traveling tent show and animal menagerie run by a managing businessman. And that model was very different from the European circus model. Later, of course, the famous showman Phineas Taylor Barnum combined the tent show and menagerie with an exhibition of human oddities, the sideshow, and put the whole thing into train cars. And thus was born P.T. Barnum's Museum, Menagerie, and Circus, which through a series of business deals and partnerships would become the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus. Point is, the modern traveling circus is a very recent evolution of equestrian shows named after a Roman racetrack, both of whom have their origins in the grassy wastelands of southern Russia. So your bard certainly didn't run off to join the circus as a child. Which isn't to say there weren't traveling performances in the Middle Ages to get heroes off the farms and into the wider world. They were just much smaller, more personal affairs. Let's start with the troubadours. Around the 11th century, a group of poets appeared in the south of France and the north of Italy. 
they became well known for a particular kind of lyrical poetry, usually romantic in nature. And they took to traveling from village to village, singing ballads, sharing poems, and carrying the latest news and gossip. They focused primarily on romantic and courtly themes, and this often earned them an audience with a wealthy elite when they visited major population centers. But they were mostly just wandering performers. Until the Crusades opened up Eastern Europe, Asia Minor, and the Holy Land of Jerusalem. And until various knights and aristocrats found themselves with little to do between the various Crusades. What happened was troubadours began to travel further abroad, and they would bring back tales of the exotic lands they visited. Meanwhile, knights and nobles who had joined the Crusades and then returned home after their battles were done found that people were hungry for stories about exotic lands. Many became troubadours, and the troubadours saw increasing demand for their services at the courts of kings and lords. Many stopped performing for the common people. Now, many rulers already had entertainers in their courts. They were called minstrels. And that word comes from the same root as minister and administrate. It literally means little servant. The minstrels primarily focused on myths, legends, and the histories of various royal families. They also had a great degree of skill in jests, japes, jokes, and tomfoolery. They had to be ready to entertain on a whim. When the troubadours and their romantic tales of exotic lands became more popular, the minstrels found themselves crowded out, so they took their acts on the road. As a result, the many feasts, fairs, and festivals that were celebrated across Middle Ages Europe suddenly gained a new form of entertainment, the wandering minstrel. And many of their old ballads and myths and legends became favorites among the peasants. But there was also another group of travelers who wandered Europe during the Middle Ages. And they had a reputation for taking children away from their provincial lives. In fact, they had a dark reputation for kidnapping children. A reputation that survives to this day. We're referring to a group that remains a highly vilified minority population in Europe to this very day. The Romani people. The Roma. The Gypsies. And they are a group whose history is not widely known or understood. Part of the problem with disentangling the truth about the Gypsies is that many groups have been conflated over the years and because the Roma people are not, themselves, a completely homogenous group. But some recent genetic evidence has helped bring to light some of the story. First, let's get the basics out of the way. The name Gypsy was first applied in England in the 16th century to a group of itinerant people who lived in insular traveling communities. The name was derived from Egyptian because it was believed they were of Egyptian origin. They weren't, though. And because of the reputation the Gypsies gained, the word gradually gained a negative connotation in Europe, and it is still considered offensive by some today. These people, the so-called gypsies, were actually members of an itinerant people who had first appeared in Europe in the 1300s and had been named the Romanes. Today, they are often called the Roma, but the Roma are merely one of the larger subgroups of the Romani people and they were originally confused with wandering minstrels due to their brightly colored clothing and their various performance arts. But there were clues that the Romani weren't just itinerant performers. First of all, there were a lot of them, not just small groups of itinerant performers, but whole family groups. And they had darker skin than the Eastern Europeans in the communities they visited. Most importantly though, they were culturally distinct and even spoke their own language. Their communities remained mobile and rarely settled. When groups did settle, as some did engage in agriculture, they remained distinct and separate from the nearby European peoples. Mobility and impermanence actually became a part of their identity. From their arrival in the lands of the modern-day Czech Republic, the Romani spread gradually across Europe, entering the Balkans, Eastern and Central Europe, and gradually even further west. As evidenced above, Romani travelers eventually reached the British Isles, and they presented something of a mystery to the scholars and clerics of Europe. Who were the Romani? Where had they really come from? Today, linguistic and genetic evidence has answered the question with a high degree of certainty. The Romani originated on the Indian subcontinent. 
Their language is closely related to old dialects of Hindi, and many of their oldest traditions can be traced back to Southern Asian cultures. As near as historians have been able to determine, the Romani migrated from Southern Asia as far back as 600 CE. Historians theorize that they may have fled the oppression of the caste system of India. When the Romani first arrived in Europe, many groups presented themselves as peaceful folk and in many cases as penitent Christians. And the Europeans made many assumptions about the traveling people, particularly that they were wandering pilgrims, exiled, and serving out some sort of religious penance. In some places, the Romani were welcomed for their new technologies, especially talents for working metal, and for their exotic stories. But many other places viewed them as outsiders. Their apparent similarity to Tartar raiders, who had plagued certain areas of Europe, didn't help. Nor did the conflicts between the Romani cultural norms and those of the European Christians. Anti-Zygonist, that is anti-Romani, sentiment began to spread, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. Romani gypsies were viewed as vagabonds and thieves. They were not to be trusted. And of course, they kidnapped children. This culminated in laws in the 1500s, banning the Romani from traveling in England and France. Worse, in 1538, in several states controlled by the Habsburgs, it was decreed that killing Romani gypsies was not a crime. This resulted in a massive killing spree. And the anti zygonist sentiment has remained quite strong throughout Europe, even into the modern era. During World War II, the Nazi regime is said to have segregated and then murdered upwards of 500,000 Romani gypsies. So, did the Romani kidnap children? Almost certainly not, at least not regularly. Any individual might be a kidnapper, but as an ethnic group, there does not appear to be any evidence that the Romani engaged in the practice. Folklorists have pointed out that the accusation of childnapping is one that is commonly leveled against outsider and alien groups. For example, legends in Christian Europe held for centuries that members of the Hebrew faith would kidnap and sacrifice children. It was called the blood libel, and it was libelous indeed, for there was no basis for it. Children's author Roald Dahl has noted that stealing children is something that is always ascribed to monsters to make them monstrous, fairies, witches, and so on, because there is little more monstrous in the human psyche than stealing a child. Does that mean children never ran off to join the gypsies? Of course not. In fact, over the many long years in Europe, intermarriage between Romani people and the local population has waxed and waned a great deal. And Romani culture is a complex collage as a result of their absorption of ideas and peoples in their travels. And the Romani gypsies are a broadly diverse group these days and number some 12 million in Europe and the Americas. But given the long plight of the Romani people and the very real discrimination they face even today, Perhaps you're better off assuming the bards in your games did just run off to join a medieval circus and leave the gypsies out of it. This has been GM Word of the Week. It's written and researched by the angry GM and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash GM Word of the Week. You can find more at gmwordoftheweek.com and theangrygm.com.